And good evening, our LBE family, fans, supporters, um, everyone. Um, where do we start? I, I guess I can start with happy second Independence Day. Um, Sister Kara, how are you and what say you this evening? I am well. Happy uh, second semi-independence <laughs> <laughs> day. You know, right. some, one of these days we're going to have a very interesting conversation, I think, on this platform about the about uh, Independence Day and outside of the ones that we've already had, because I think we've we've done we've covered the what to what to the slave is the Fourth of July, but that's it. We'll not, my fourth said, <laughs> not my fourth said, Mr. Douglas said, um, <laughs> but uh, I think we, we definitely do owe it uh, to, to this project and what we do to have that conversation. I, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of made the decision I'd like to, um, raise awareness that America truly does have two independence days and, and, um, and, and, and we, we owe it to the project to have that conversation and, um, and see where we go with that. But nevertheless, did you have a good fourth? I did. I did. Yeah. I saw you. Uh, celebrating with with Flagstaff and mm -hmm. um, and and so it it truly is a, a a beautiful thing that if we could uh, overstand um, how and why we have or 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 saying that we we celebrate Independence Day twice here in America. But I think before we get to that, we need to set the record straight um, on some more Black history. And I'm excited that we have one of our frequent uh, guest presenters. And um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, step off and, and let you make the introduction. And uh, I'll see you on the other side. All right. Sounds good. Right. And as always, we say welcome to our community. Thank you for joining us this evening for this discussion on the history, the true history of Wall Street, uh, the Weeping Day, and um, so many things I am sure we're going to dive into tonight in this conversation. Leading us tonight is, as Reverend Dr. Lewis shared, a frequent guest and collaborator on this program, the soon-to-be Dr. Donald Guillory. Uh, I like collaborator. Is, I like that part. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm still, I'm just going to call you Dr. Guillory because okay. it's coming. It's so soon. It's coming. It, it's uh, going to be right is, down the road. <laughs> He is a doctoral candidate at the University of Mississippi, whose focus is on race, gender, and identity in the history of the U.S. and Latin America. As a graduate of Georgia Southern University, he earned his Bachelor of Arts in International Studies and History and Master of Arts in History. After serving in the U.S. Army, he attended Arizona State University, where he earned master's degrees in education and liberal studies, focusing on the role that film and television play in shaping our perspectives about culture and gender. Welcome back, Dr. Guillory. Thank you. Thank you to be here. It's always weird to hear it. I'm like, it's like, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here as, as always glad to participate in these discussions. Um, these, these, in some cases overdue, uh, and, and also well needed. Um, someone described like knowledge is, is like you're in this desert, um, which I, I was at one point living in Arizona, but you're in this desert and you're looking for that drop of water. 
And when it comes to studying history, you're trying to understand yourself, where you fit into the world, where you fit into everything. Those little drops are so essential at, at helping you survive to that point where you can go forward and thrive. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about uh, is going to expand on uh, uh, on what we discussed in, in the weeks leading up to this, um, which is also talking about the economic uh, motivation, uh, the the weeping day, also the, the way in which there is that loophole within the 13th Amendment that um, in recent years, there's been discussion about closing that loophole. Uh, and I'll get to the loophole when we get to the 13th Amendment. Um, but again, I want to thank you for inviting me, always thinking thinking of me with these discussions, because if there's one thing I love talking about, it's I love talking about history, and especially when it's history that we really don't get to talk about too often, or mm -hmm. in, in the current times, there's this push to not talk about it at all, or even to have the resources available to talk about these things. Um, so when it comes to the the PowerPoint, I, since it's been a few months since we've done this, um, there'll be a couple of times when I'll just I'll just ask you to skip a few uh, as we go through because I'm gonna I'm gonna get a little bit redundant with some of the things I say, and with about 50 slides, uh, we will not make the time <laughs> limit for tonight, uh, especially considering how much I talk. Uh, so if you would uh, please jump forward to the. Frederick Douglass uh, portion. All right. Uh, actually, you know what? Let's go even further than that. Uh, let's go to Slavery in Antebellum America, the second one. All right. So when we tip typically think about slavery or chattel slavery itself, um, we often end up dehumanizing the individuals that uh, were unfortunate or unwilling participants in this system. So when we're looking at the numbers, we're talking about the people that are that are part of this, as far as those people that are victims, we have to think about how massive this system was. So roughly about a third of the population in, in the Southern states, those deep South states, places like Alabama, Mississippi, South Carolina, even though South Carolina doesn't wanna be called the deep South, uh, when you have a 60% and plus population of enslaved people and that are part of that same system, you get lumped in as well. Um, but roughly a third of the total population in the South were enslaved people. So roughly half of the, the products that you had in the South at one point, and actually at one point it goes up even higher, half of that was dedicated towards cotton. But in those same regions, you had rice, you had sugar cultivation, you had indigo, you had uh, shipbuilding, you had skilled jobs, and you also had uh, more skilled jobs within the city. But then you also had skilled jobs and skilled labor in the rural setting. And I and I pause because I never want to say skilled and unskilled because there's no such thing as unskilled labor. Because if it's something that you have somebody doing that you can't do, that means that they have a skill that you don't have. So different skills depending on the 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 work needs. Uh, next slide, please. So cotton is the the one commodity that really starts to drive the 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 U.S. economy, especially after the the Industrial Revolution. And you have a need for uh, textiles for excuse me. You need you need raw materials for textile factories in the Northeast, as well as in, in Europe. So there becomes a massive boom for cotton in the beginning, the opening part of the 19th century, up until about the, well, hell, it, it, until the 20th century is really when you have this, this high need for it. And it's not just within the South, as far as within the United States, but you also see, uh, cotton itself becoming an important global commodity that's being raised in other parts of the world, in Egypt and in India. Uh, you have places in South America that are uh, that are growing it and then shipping it to factories in the U.S., excuse me, factories in Europe, as well as other factories abroad. Um, next slide, please, because I'm going to repeat something that's on this slide. There was so much gold, excuse me, so much cotton and such a dependency on cotton and the value of cotton was so high that it was referred to as white gold. And we typically look at oil as being black gold. Uh, 
for this the same thing with respect to the sugar industry and the cotton industry there was so much money to be made there was such a financial incentive with this type of commodity with this type of product that is going to heavily dictate things like politics it's going to it's going to heavily dictate uh the role that slavery plays within the united states both as a social function a political function and an economic one just tracking to make sure i'm on the right slide on my end <laughs> Uh, so I'm just repeating so we can keep going on that one. Let's jump all the way to slavery and cotton production. Now I feel bad for all the time I, I spent making those. Oh, one, one back, one back. Slavery and cotton production. It's with the, the red text at the top. Yes. All right. When I talk about this financial incentive or this economic control that slavery has with respect to the United States as a whole, you had development that was taking place in the North. It, we're talking about places like Philadelphia, New York, Boston. Uh, I'll even include places like Baltimore because they're developing uh, shipbuilding. You've got industry, you have factories that are coming in, you've got more immigrants that are coming in and taking taking those jobs within uh, the within within the factory settings to help drive this economy. But the one thing that they need is cotton. And the one thing that cotton needs from the perspective of slaveholders is you need free financial, free labor not liberated labor as far as like you you're free as far as where you can go and and choose what you want to do you want to have the cheapest labor possible and for them the cheapest labor possible is made uh made possible due to chattel slavery now because you have so much industry that's in the north slavery can't gain a foothold there anymore duly uh due to manumission due to uh slavery bans in some states but there is that finance there's no financial incentive in northern states to have this industry is driving the north and uh, northern economy and also social factors for the south it comes down to slavery is going to be the end all be all for us it is going to as i said is going to dictate uh your political structure your social mores and norms it's going to drive the economy so as a result, not as much industrial development is taking place in the South when compared to the North. The banking industry in the North is involved in the textile industries, into different factories, into shipping, education, uh, and, and also um, ship, build, ship building as well as shipping. I got ahead of myself there. Banks in the South they were driven based off of slavery, selling enslaved people, financing enslaved people, providing the loans for people to go out and actually lease slaves from someone else. They are handling all of this. So the banking industry in the South is being driven by slavery itself or the needs of slaveholders. And if you look at I'm using my cursor as if you can see it on my end. <laughs> now, if you look at this chart, uh, the print didn't come out the way I wanted, so I apologize. But the way it works from 1790, okay, you got 750,000 slaves, enslaved people that are working. Now, this does not mean that all 750,000 worked with cotton, but cotton itself you're only getting about 3,000 bales a year from, uh, yeah, you're only getting about 3,000 bales a year in 1790. And this is prior to the invention of the cotton gin. The cotton gin is one of the best and worst inventions depending on your perspective. There is very little financial incentive for cotton. Again, 750,000 enslaved people nationwide 3,000 bales of cotton. You're not going to make money off of this. But as you see, by 1800, we go from 3,000 to 75,000 bales. And you've only had an increase of 250,000 enslaved people. But boom, you see it keeps going and going and going to the point where you almost have a bale of cotton for almost every enslaved worker. And reminder, 
not every enslaved worker worked with cotton. Roughly about half of the product of the United States uh, was cotton. Out of that four and a half million by the by the eve of the Civil War, they were doing everything and anything. You had enslaved people that were in animal husbandry as far as like breeding animals, training horses, cattle, things like uh, raising cattle, things like that. But you had the vast majority that were working in cotton, rice, sugar. Those were the three of the biggest ones with cotton, of course, being the biggest one. The Southern economy, especially by the time of 1850, we enter this, this period of popular sovereignty where any new state that's coming in gets to choose whether or not it's going to be enslaved, a, a slave state or a free state. And you have border wars that take place as a result of this with, with, um, with Kansas and uh, the infamous acts of, of people like John Brown, where the tide is very clear that slavery is going to be very condensed to the South, very pushed into the South and what becomes known as the border states. And you are really just pu pushing as much labor into those spaces to pull out as much raw material or finished products as you can. So those Southern states, again, Texas, all the way to Virginia, which Virginia itself splits into two states when, when the war breaks out uh, from Texas to Virginia, you have those areas that now become part of the Confederacy. And they're doing this partially because they have a racialized incentive, they have a financial incentive, they have a social and a political incentive to stay, stay the course with this. Uh, let me go ahead and if you would jump to the slide where it is value of cotton exports, please. Okay. Now to piggyback off of that previous slide, this is where you're looking at the value of cotton within the U.S. exports. We go from 7% at the beginning of the 19th century to 58%, roughly 60% by the eve of the Civil War. There is a massive financial necessity behind keeping this institution. Next slide, please. Or actually, like I said, I'm going to skip around a lot. So. Uh, let's go to maintaining order. Okay, thank you. So, I lost on my slide. slide. Oh, one second, I have to catch up. I'm going to... Skip ahead again, because I'm just going to be getting redundant. So if you would, just go ahead and go to the slave market, please. I'm so sorry I did not take those animations out. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So one of the more famous slave markets themselves is is the one that, uh, well, I guess takes place in the market house, um, where what we've associated with being Wall Street. Now there's some mis there's some misunderstandings with respect to Wall Street, uh, you know, because with the internet and the way things are, sometimes people pass something around and it gets accepted as fact. Wall Street was called Wall Street because of a basically a retaining wall, a a, a, a berm, uh, a levee that was constructed. Um, and slave purchases, sales, and trades took place in that same space because that was where a lot of money, a lot of products, a lot of people were moving back and forth. So Wall Street is not named Wall Street because, you know, a, a good number of enslaved people were put on a wall to stand and be inspected. It was Wall Street because that was where the, the levee, where this wall was put up to to prevent uh, uh, the degradation of the land and, and, and prevent any flooding. But this is where you you would go to buy enslaved people. The, again, a lot of money is being made. A lot of 
power brokers are in charge of this and you have to designate where this is going to be done so that when you are conducting these these sales they're done publicly they're done legally and they are done uh i said public already but in full view of everyone so you can get the the best value for your enslaved worker or at least try to next next slide please now with that you also have to understand that this is a history that has been talked about more recently. And by recent, I mean, last 25 years, uh, because we're coming to grips with the fact, or at least trying to come to grips with the fact that slavery took place in places other than the South. There is no part of the original colonies or even that first 25 states that we had where slavery did not have an effect did not have a hand in the shaping of those states, of the people, and of those industries. But by having historical placards, we at least start having those discussions by having that information available to people in the public spaces, and in a lot of cases, in public spaces in which those actions took place. Next slide, please. Now, I want to include that, that portion about Wall Street because I want to pivot in talking about uh, what was requested from, from your end. Um, this discussion about Weeping Day. Now, Weeping Day itself is on record as being the largest sale of enslaved people in a 48-hour period in American history. So you had, out of a, a group of about 460 enslaved people, you had 430 that were sold. And this was really because the, the Butler family was um, well, one of the relatives was in debt. One of the brothers was in debt. And the best thing he could do was sell his portion of the family estate, which was some land, as well as well over 400 enslaved people. Now, it took place in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, I've got on here Chatham County, Georgia itself. But to, to be more specific, you're talking about Savannah, Georgia is where this is held. What is very problem problematic about this is you have families that are sold, you have families that are split up, and individuals who witnessed the sale talked about how much crying, how much wailing, how much weeping was taking, pl taking place as people are being sold away from their relatives, sold away from their families, when babies are, are taken out of the arms of their mothers, to be sold, and the the massive barbaric presentation of this, that it's not, you know, it, it's not something as simple as I've got one of these. It's not as simple as like a charging cable. I'm going to go buy this thing. Because that is the way in which these individuals are looking at it at this time. But once the weeping starts, you have this moment where you kind of question the humanity of this the humanity of the individuals that are being sold, as well as the humanity of the individuals who are buying and selling, and the humanity of those individuals that are watching this take place. So this is one of those few moments where people, at least documented, people question whether or not this is the right thing to do, whether or not this is something that is just. But within those two days, you had, as I said, 430 people that were sold, because not everyone was sold in, in, as part of this. 430 people that were sold. The total amount of money that was made off the, the lives, off the bodies of these individuals at that sale was $303,000. You adjust this for inflation. This two-day sale of 430 people would be the equivalent of $7 million. And in some cases, the, the rapidity or the, 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 the speed at which this is taking place, you're getting bids, person sold, and they're moved off. And then you move to the next person. The range, as far as the purchase range for these individuals, went from $250 at the lowest end, as far as what, was, what has been captured as far as the records, $250 lowest, the most that was spent on an individual was $1,800. Now, Roughly about, uh, since we're talking about 19, excuse me, 1859, and you were to adjust that for 2023, remember, total amount is $7 million. 
But for 2023, you're looking at an $1,800 sale being the equivalent to someone being sold or bought for $80,000 in today's money. $250, you're talking about ten dollars to $15,000 per person. The ages at which these individuals were sold, the lowest end, three months. The oldest person that was sold, 70. And some of these people, depending on uh, your your status, your age, your your sex, um, your trade, as far as how much you were going to demand at auction, how much someone was going to be willing to pay for you at auction. Now, if you would hit that next slide for me, please, because this is should no should, should surprise no one. Now, one of the questions that I was asked uh, in, in putting this together was, you know, what business connections are there? Or what connections are there to corporate entities? And there are several groups that are still exi in existence to today, uh, till today, that have connections to the system of slavery itself in many different ways. So if you look at this first one, New York Life, AIG, Aetna, insurance providers. If you were buying an enslaved person, if you were smart about it, just like with any quote unquote property, because that's the way they're regarded, with any property, you are going to take out an insurance policy to protect against losses. So your home, uh, in all honesty, you can't buy a home without having home insurance, or at least you can't go through the, 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 the process of buying a home without how, uh, home insurance. I believe in every state in the United States, it's illegal to drive a car but and not have car insurance on that car. Health insurance, you know, you want to get taken care of at the doctor. This is what you, you want to protect your family in, the, in case of your demise. You have life insurance. So during the same period of the 19th century, you had companies that processed life insurance policies and Dam, uh, uh, um, liability policies for enslaved workers. This was a way for enslaved people to be further commodified. You had individuals on, at least with slaveholders uh, and those who were in charge of these people's bodies would take out these, these policies and in some cases, there is nothing more nefarious that they're doing other than protecting their, quote unquote, protecting their investment. If George, my, my slave dies, I'll be compensated $500, $1,000, whatever his worth is. But if I am down and destitute and I have insurance policies on my enslaved workers, I might do something to one of those enslaved workers so I can collect the insurance policy, collect the money on that insurance policy. Beyond that, you also have banking, which I, I mentioned in one of the previous slides. Uh, banks that are operating in the South are doing so for the main purpose of financing the sale, the, the purchasing, and the leasing of enslaved workers. Now, the other one, textile mills, as I, as I brought up earlier, you had textile mills in the Northeast. You had those in Europe as well that heavily depended on this enslaved labor uh, and the, the raw materials of cotton and other raw materials for their factories. Domino sugar, again, sugar was a, a, a major commodity in the, in the Southeast, or I should say throughout the South in the wetlands. Um, the, the building of rail lines throughout the South as well. And then... This is another thing that I did not discover until I was diving through some, some, some content. You can determine a good or bad economic year as far as like how much inflation or deflation is taking place by looking at the value of an enslaved worker, comparing it from 1800 to 1810, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. You can determine the course of the economy based on the value of enslaved workers. Next slide, please. All right. I went beyond economics 
to throw this in because it, it doesn't get talked about enough. Medicine, especially the field of American gynecology, would not be where it is if it had not been for the lack of agency of enslaved women, the exploitation of their bodies, the violation of their bodies for people like J. Marion Sims, who wanted to study the way in which women's bodies functioned, but also studying and practicing new surgical techniques. These women could not consent to any of these experiments. They had no say. They, they In fact, they're completely out, left out of the record uh, of any of his, his medical journals. So when there are pictures of experiments and surgical procedures, a white woman is drawn in place of the black woman. So they get further erased and further abused by not even being included in the documents that he's submitting for people to use for medical school. Now, in his notes and in correspondence, he talks about uh, how black women can have a higher tolerance for pain. He talks about how he's able to do experiments without, uh, without anesthesia how the women were so willing to take orders from him. So you're looking at this, even without looking at it in 2023 lens, if you look at this just from an outside lens as an outside observer, common sense tells you, of course, they can't consent to, of course, they're not going to complain about the medical procedures. Of course, they're not going to tell you about how much pain they're going through. They're not going to have that type of conversation with you. So what ends up happening is J. Marion Sims mutilates scores of women, scores of black and slave women, and then also Irish immigrant women. He mutilates these women in his call for, for science, at least understanding things better. What he does is he leads to a, a, a high amount of medical misinformation that is still used and still taught in medical schools to this day. And if you know of any especially any black women who have gone to the doctor and have talked about the way that their doctor has talked to them about their pain or misdiagnosing them or not listening to them at all. It all has its roots here in J. Marion Sims and within the system of slavery itself. Uh, next slide, please. I don't know why it was telling me that it was misspelled. All right. So that jumps us because we we're talking about 1859, 1860. That gets us to 1865 with the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment, along with, um, I, I would just say, along with the first 10 amendments for that matter, the, the Bill of Rights, we have an understanding of them, but we don't understand them. Speaking of the general population, we have an understanding, but we don't understand. So we typically look at the 13th Amendment or just the First Amendment. I can say whatever I want, freedom of speech. But if you start reading through it, you read through the clauses, there are limitations on what you can do. 13th Amendment, the same. 13th Amendment gets rid of slavery. So what most people do, you see this part that I underlined, most people seem to leave this part out. And they read it as, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So basically anything that can be claimed as U.S. territory. Slavery does not exist. The loophole exists right in the middle of the amendment. And that loophole states, except as punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. We have stretched this out to where it doesn't even matter if you're convicted. If you are waiting arraignment, if you're waiting trial, you can still be put on work details and you can be put on... Um, on work assignments. Now, uh, next slide, please. This comes in partial response because of this thing known as the Black, I should say the Black Codes come in response to the 13th Amendment. In places like Mississippi, you could be found guilty, excuse me, you could be charged with a crime of vagrancy. And vagrancy simply means, or at least it's open to interpretation of this period, vagrancy could just be, you don't have a job. So we'll give you a job. So we will punish you by making you work for the same landholders, the same slaveholders that you or your ancestors had worked for during slavery. So as a result, 
you have a massive amount of newly freed black people that don't have jobs, but are looking for employment, especially when they get kicked off of uh, the land, I think from General Order 15 from, from Grant, I'm sorry, um, from Sherman, where a lot of the land in the South gets handed over to these newly free people, and they only have it for a few months before Andrew Johnson rescinds that and hands the land back over to uh, its, its previous owners and these individuals' previous owners. So now that these individuals do not have land that they're working on, that they own, uh, or, or a stable employment, they can now be forced into working. They can be forced into sharecropping. They can be forced into day labor. And the issue is, if these men or women are without employment, that is good enough rationale to force them into employment. Next slide, please. Oh, you have to click it again. This this is another one of the ones that I was, uh, I forgot to take the animations off. So the 14th Amendment. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. The 14th Amendment, really no loopholes here, but all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. This was a great way to piggyback off the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and to give it some teeth. So you cannot, as a state function, or as a local function, you cannot limit the rights of anyone who is a citizen unless you go through the process, you go through the court of law. But again, you can use the loophole of the 13th Amendment, which states we can force you into labor, we can force you into this if you've been convicted. Next slide, please, because this one is going to be a little bit fun. Okay. Now, the 14th Amendment itself is put up to ensure that the rights of black people are protected. Now, it's a blanket application because it's going to it's going to apply to everyone even if it didn't even if it didn't necessarily need to apply to you. If you're a white male, you already had rights in this country. We don't have to express that. But now with the 14th Amendment, it is even though it's not explicitly saying it, it is now extending that right to all people within the United States that are born within the United States. And that is going to include women as well because the 15th Amendment leaves women out. But it does not expressly state women are included, but it does not d deny women that right either. So what this actually does is it ensures that you have teeth to the Civil Rights Act of 1866. So in 1868, when this gets passed, it is letting any of these former Confederate states know, any of these former slaveholding states know that if you try, there will be federal punishment coming your way. If you try to deny them the, the right to freedom, the right to their citizenship, or then the right for them to vote, you will be punished. 15, I'm sorry, no, next slide, please. Now, I'm including all three of these amendments for a reason. 15th Amendment states that any, I'm sorry, the right of a citizen to vote cannot be denied based off a of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Doesn't say anything about gender because some states allowed women to vote, some didn't, but there's not going to be a blanket application to allow all women. But it's saying that if you have the right to vote, it will not be, I'm sorry, you have the right to vote in your status, race, Anything like that is not cannot be used to prevent you. Now, this is not going to get into the voting issue because, uh, as I pointed out in a previous one, southern states found a way because they found loopholes where loopholes did not exist in order to stop this from happening. Next slide, please. All right. Now, again, 
talked about that loophole and how it could be exercised. Except as punishment for a crime where the party shall have been duly convicted. This is how you get around the 13th Amendment. Or I should say, this is how you use the 13th Amendment to get around the 13th Amendment. It has its own self, uh, uh, self, self-referencing loophole. So the way that this works is you can have things like convict leasing. Now, we've all heard of, you know, work details, things like that, that can take place where, um, I don't know, I can't remember if they do it in Arizona, but I know in the South, it's it's still one of those things, not convict leasing because it's illegal, but work details, where you will be driving on the highway or a road and you'll see, you know, some some men, maybe some women with the, the high-vis vest, or they might be in a, in a jumpsuit or something like that, and they're doing things like picking up trash or they're, they're uh, mowing the, the, the sides of the road, the grass on the side of the road. Those are typical functions that you'll find from the sheriff's department, uh, or you might even find from your local prison where you know low-risk offenders are let out to do things like that. Um, that's not what this is. Convict leasing is simply you are property of the state at this point and we can send you wherever we want. We can do something with you that we could not if you weren't incarcerated. So in a lot of Southern states, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana are the three I'm gonna pick on right now. But Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana were notorious for this. So in Alabama, you had mining. You had mining for iron ore. So there were a good number of black and white convicts that were leased out to mining companies or to steel mills to go into the mines to get iron ore. A lot of deaths, very dangerous situation. Uh, in Mississippi and, and in Louisiana, you had people who were convicted by the state that were then forced back onto cotton and sugar plantations. So you would start off the day early in the morning, you will be driven out or you'd be walked out to the cotton plantation or in the case of Louisiana with Angola prison, you really just have to walk outside of the prison or really you don't have to go too far away from it. You would then work in the cotton fields all day and then you would go back to the prison. Same virtual conditions as when you had legalized chattel slavery. The same thing with the railroads as well. You had you had uh, individuals that were part of convict leasing that were building railroads, that were helped laying the track. Next slide, please. I hate picking on Louisiana, but I got to sometimes. Uh, the biggest irony here, or one of the biggest ironies when it comes to this situation is this. One of the largest prisons in the United States is Angola, or I should say it's Louisiana State Prison. It's nicknamed Angola because it is named after the plantation on which, or nicknamed after the nickname of the plantation on which that, that prison currently sits. It is nicknamed Angola because when the plantation existed, the vast majority of the enslaved workers, uh, it, they could trace themselves to that nation or to, to that, that group. So Angola, they pride themselves in having things like rodeos uh, and, and um, public service and things like that. But one of the things Angola has done for the longest time until convict leasing was was made illegal, was they actually grew cotton on the grounds of that plantation and in, I almost said enslaved workers. Uh, and prison, prison labor is used in order to grow, cultivate, and harvest that cotton. The irony here is you have made it possible for descendants of enslaved people to be re-enslaved through this process, through the same amendment that freed their forefathers, their ancestors, that amendment is being used to virtually enslave them today. 
Now, again, it's something that has been in usage for a long time. Um, in fact, uh, Hillary Clinton, she she got she caught some heat a few years ago because I think some um, some portions of her one of her autobiographies uh, that wasn't used was made public. And it ta- and she was talking about when she was um, the first lady of Arkansas that they had all this labor. These convicts would come in, they'd make coffee. They would uh, do the landscaping for for the the governor's mansion, and people basically pointed out like you had slave labor. That's what you were bragging about or talking about, and what it caused people to do was start to to reinvestigate this and start to question like why are we having this take place in a country where we claim that slavery does not exist? Next slide, please. Now, this show, the show Orange is the New Black, I think it's still on Netflix. Um, if I had hair, I would say that show made me pull out my hair because of how how good they were at talking about issues without talking about the issues. Because what we've done is we've gone from a convict leasing system to a prison labor system. So you have a lot of private industries, private companies that will make use of prison labor. Uh, and the excuse that's given is like, hey, well, we, we do pay. They don't pay that much, but they pay because they're able to find loopholes to where they can go below minimum wage in order to pay any of these inmates. And several of the companies I've listed up here, you got McDonald's, Walmart, Hertz. Uh, Hertz is one of the more interesting ones because Hertz, uh, when, when it was made public, Hertz was actually using prison labor to handle the reservation. So when you wanted to reserve uh, a car, you wanted to rent a car, your reservation may have gone through a, a, a prisoner who was handling that on the phone or on the computer. Uh, Verizon and Sprint, the same thing as far as handling bill pay uh, and, and servicing, things like that. Victoria's Secret, I included this image from Orange is New Black because that was who they were kind of uh, uh, poking at for that for that episode because Victoria's Secret it was made public a few years ago that they were using prison labor to make their products um McDonald's and and a few other uh fast food places when it came to meat packing they had uh prison labor that was being used for the meat packing one of the the more infuriating ones is with the uh with the California prison system is that when they have wildfires Prisoners are used to help put out those fires, help fight those fires. And what's problematic about it is, one, you're putting these people into a dangerous situation that they're not well-trained in, not well-equipped for in a lot of cases. Even though they do give some training, it's not something that was their vocation. If someone does want to become a firefighter once they get out of prison, they're actually barred from being a firefighter or an EMT in the state of California, at least in some jurisdictions in California. Next slide, please. All right. Now we talked about, you know, how much they could get paid and and finding these loopholes as far as we can pay them less than minimum wage because of their status. Because of the low wages, you're talking about an average of 30 cents to a little bit over a dollar an hour for, for these laborers. The generation, excuse me, the wealth that they have generated, at least in the past decade, has averaged $11 billion a year of profits, of, 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 uh, of productivity that they've, they've produced because that is unpaid labor or underpaid labor that many of these businesses have gotten away with. Now, what a state would argue, whether it's a state like Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, what they would argue is this actually saves the state money. It makes money for the state because uh, these men and women can now make some money. They can actually, you have partnerships with these businesses that will pay different stipends. And sometimes you'll have campaign donations that, that we're gonna make this possible. But for them, it's about, it comes down to money. Um, But also, I I left this out of the presentation, but I I think it needs to be said. 
uh, when you're looking at a lot of these prisons themselves, whether they are private or whether they are, are publicly owned prisons, they're government prisons, private prisoners, excuse me, private prisons often have contracts with the states in which they're operating to where they have to have an occupancy level met. So in a state like Texas, I can't remember what the figure is right, right off the top of my head. But in the state of Texas, when George W. Bush was, was governor, and this is a while ago, so forgive me, when George W. Bush was the governor, there were state contracts with private prisons that required the prisons to be around 60% full. And if it went below 60%, there was a financial penalty. So in order to save money, we're going to contract it out with these private prisons that are going to cut things down to the bone but then they're also going to charge the state for housing, feeding these inmates, and then charge the state again if you don't have a certain amount of prisoners in there, which is also why you see a lot of uh, criminal uh, crime fighting legislation that gets passed that is about punishing people, punishing things like um, uh, drug addicts, for that matter. Instead of pushing for drug treatment, we're going to put you in prison. Because, you know, a simple possession, we're going to get you for several years, we're going to get you some, uh, some federal time, some state time. And while you're there, we can actually make use of your labor. So to go back to that TV show, Orange is the New Black, that was one of the things that I was glad that they pointed out, which was you had people that were low level offenders, you know, maybe, you know, something like, I get uh, nonviolent crimes that they might have been convicted for. And they're there for about three to five years with people who are there for 20 years. But they are there to save the state or make the state some money, as well as those businesses. Uh, next slide, please. Now, I said the average, the average depends, uh, depends on the state that you're in. It could go from 30 cents an hour to a little bit over a dollar. Some pay more. You, you might get more in some other states. But there is no set minimum wage in every state for incarcerated workers. So again, these businesses, as well as these prisons, find loopholes. And if you look, again, I'm using my cursor on my end as if you can see it. If you go from Texas all the way to South Carolina, not including Louisiana, you're talking about zero dollars. You do not have to pay you do not have to pay incarcerated workers anything to make the argument that this is not slavery is is mind-boggling uh some people make these arguments you know it, it's always this idea of like they should have thought about this before they committed the crime they should have done this they should have done this but that doesn't mean that these people cannot have some sense of humanity they can't have some sense of at least those who did the crime they can't have some sense of, of restitution while they're in. Next slide, please. Because these are the last two bulky slides that I have. All right. These states themselves, if you look at those dark blue ones, what this is measuring is the amount of prisoners per 100,000 people. Alaska has the most. Now, again, this is proportional, so it's per 100,000. You have 633 prisoners per 100,000 people in Alaska. Now, Alaska only has a population of around 600,000, 700,000 people. Um, but if you go to a state like Mississippi, Louisiana, they're both nearly 600, 600 incarcerated people per 100,000 people. Texas is only lighter blue because their population is higher. So these lower population states, by comparison, you have more prisoners in the state of Texas, obviously, because it's a larger state. But when you're talking about proportions and proportionality, the hardest ones are right here. Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Mississippi, Alabama. And you can even throw Georgia in there as well. But Georgia has a much higher population than its, than its sister states um, in in even looking at the way that it's much, you have many more darker blue states in the South than in other states, it's very telling that you're revisiting some, uh, some issues of the past. Next slide, please. Let 
when we talk about this financial incentive, or at least the way that money works into this, I've got this chart on the right side that shows, you know, where money goes within this system. Now, don't, you know, delve too deep into this because it, yeah, I'm not sure how well it's showing up on your side. But there is a lot of there are a lot of people that are behind bars. And we're talking about state, federal, county jails, uh, immigration detention centers. Now, even in the immigration detention centers, which are privately run, they're contracted out, they are still susceptible to the same loophole that natural born citizens are. If you commit the crime, we can, then, or sorry, excuse me, if you are, actually, I take that back even further because some of the loopholes allow for you not to even be convicted of the crime. You are just simply detained. Your labor can be used by the state. So the problems here going forward are things like the cash bail system. Uh, in a state like New York, uh, there was revisiting the cash bail system because of uh, issues with Rikers Island. Uh, and people being people who were just too poor to pay the bail money to get out of jail until their trial. So you have people who are waiting in jail at Rikers Island, one of the more notorious uh, jails there is, um, waiting a year, two years just to be seen by a judge. Mandatory minimum. So the idea that I can't even go on probation, I have a simple crime, let's, let's just say this pen. I shoplifted this pen. Depending on where you are, you could have a, a mandatory minimum because the value of the pen exceeded a certain amount of money. So the judge in that case cannot award probation. He has to or she has to. The book says I have to give you three years or I have to give you five years or I have to give you 10 years. There's no probation involved in, in any crimes that are considered uh, susceptible to mandatory minimums. So you therein have a built-in workforce just off of mandatory minimums. Then you've also got to factor in the way that we police, right? So stop and frisk laws and, or stop and frisk policies in places like New York or broken windows policies where we're going to go looking for where we think crime has taken place. We are looking heavily for something, even if it doesn't exist, even if it isn't there, uh, which is why you also have some people that are charged with resisting arrest for something like a stop and frisk. The police stop you. They want to talk to you. You don't want to talk to them. And they can escalate to a situation to where they can claim that you're resisting arrest. You then get charged with that you are now having to defend yourself and possibly run the risk of having to go to another level uh, of, the, of the judicial system. Not only that, you also have people who plead out because they're, they're coerced into uh, confessions. Thing. But anyway, that gets into a whole different thing. Uh, this is something I discovered not too recently, and that has to deal with the parole boards. The parole board situation in some states allows just blanket denials. Your time is up in prison. You've served your three years. You've served your five years. The parole board can then deem that you're not ready to come back. And with it being a place like Alabama, you see how it's disproportionately hurting poor people and black and brown people. Um, I already mentioned the, the private prison contracts as far as mandatory capacities themselves. And if they go over, let's say they go 100 percent, but now they're 110 percent, they're they're overflowing in the prison. There is no. There is no letting people out of prison because we are we are. Uh, we're packed to the gills with prisoners. And then there's also this curious one that's at the bottom. Tax credits. You have businesses that can gain a $2,400 per work release inmate. So you'll have some companies that will say, you know, oh, well, we have work release inmates that are, that are doing these jobs. For some inmates, at least some that I've talked to and, and, of course, read some documents as well, some of them take the work release because it means they're not in prison. They're outside. 
they get something to do other than being inside a prison that, that's a dangerous place. They take those positions, but they don't get paid or they get paid very little. By comparison, and we talked about the $11 billion that's generated in goods and services uh, and productivity. These businesses also get a tax credit for each and la every last uh, work release inmate that they use. But those same inmates, those same work release inmates that they are using and getting a tax credit for, they will not hire upon that person's release in many cases. So what ends up happening is you have this perpetual, this revolving door of prisons and the prison system where you have people that are going to be prone to recidivism because they are not given the tools to not be in this situation. You can't access public housing. You can't get public services. Uh, you are basically having to find a way to survive. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, recidivism involves people that go and participate in, in an illicit economy, in the unofficial economy, and then find themselves going right back to prison. And this cycle continues. And that's where I'm going to end it, because I think that's my last slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Let, here, let me give you a couple of other examples. But yeah, you can end this slide. A couple of other examples, um, things like, I mean, little crimes, jaywalking, public drinking, loitering, um, turnstile jumping in places like New York has become very popular for police to like prosecute people or uh, arrest people and have them prosecuted over. Um and as a result, as I said, you end up having people that are put into the system, sometimes at a young age, but then you have people that are put into a system that they can never escape. And you have businesses, politicians, or public officials uh, that are able to take advantage of this. Um, and then even beyond that, you have prisons, prisons themselves that are traded on the, on the, on the stock exchange, uh, in the stock market, um, where we go from Wall Street being used as a way to sell individuals into slavery or sell them to someone else in slavery we now have gone to a point where wall street is trading shares for businesses that are profiting from enslaved people or virtually enslaved people in the form of the incarcerated uh dr gillery thank you for that presentation, I was sharing with our uh, our co-hosts and, and um, producers for this program that every time you are on this show, <laughs> I am equal parts inspired and enraged. <laughs> <laughs> wanted to just fix it. We got to fix. Oh goodness, we we just need to fix it. Well, um, I I do what I can. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I, I joked with uh, one of my committee members. And he's like, are you going back to Arizona when you're done? I said, nope. He's like, why? I said, after my dissertation comes out, I will not be welcome back because oh. people are going to get enraged knowing what took place in Phoenix. Mm. <laughs> well, we will always bring you right back here and we will uh, sit in that with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, let's uh, let's dive into some questions here. Okay. Um, so one of the interesting things that I kept coming across as I was reading about um, our topic for tonight, I came across a surprising number of articles that were speaking about uh, the role of slavery in the economic development of America as being, and I, I'm quoting, uh, exaggerated. And, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. And, <laughs> so that was that was going to be my question. I think you just answered it. Uh, would you agree with that assessment, or is it fair to say how essential American slavery was to not only the, the development of the American economy, but also the economic prosperity of other nations as well at that time? Here, here's what I'm going to say, and I'm saying this in Mississippi. Hmm. If it had not been for the institution of chattel slavery, the United States, one, would not exist. I mean, it would not exist the way it does. 
So when you're talking about the formation of the, the country, right? Big arguments. I mean, we just, well, I didn't celebrate. I, I acknowledge it. I don't celebrate it. But we, we just had the 4th of July this past week. There were arguments at that time about how are we going to be talking about fighting for our freedom, but y'all, and this is, you know, some of the Northern delegates, but y'all are owning people. Like, this is not okay. So you have in the, in the, in the Declaration of Independence, as well as in the Constitution, references to slavery, references to these individuals. And we have this pesky thing that comes up every four years every four years that is dictated based off of a compromise that was made when the United States was first formed, and that is the Electoral College. Mm -hmm. Because the Electoral College, whether people want to realize it or not, I mean, you can go back and look in the forms and you see like, yes, this is true, because, but there are people that are still in denial. The Electoral College is directly connected to slaveholders not wanting to give up too much power. So the three-fifths compromise and the Electoral College are a way to balance out having these heavily populated states like New York, at the time, New York, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania. Balance your population in Virginia and Georgia, as well as the Carolinas, against theirs. So if we can band together, we get representation based off the enslaved people that are here, but we only get 60% of that, but that's gonna to count towards how many representatives we have and how many uh, electoral votes we have. We can find a way around this because those, those wealthy white men, those wealthy planters in the South, they were shaking in their boots at the idea of poor white men getting the vote because there were a lot more poor white men that were in, the, in these areas than there were people with money. And I mean, poor white people in the Northeast as well. They were worried about those folks voting and they knew that they weren't going to advocate for their slaves to vote. So the only option they could come up with is y'all can count them too. We just can't count all of them. So, I mean, well, the South wanted to count them one as one, but the North was uh, Northern states argued that you count them uh, only three fifths of them. But the United States would not be what it is. It would not have been what it was in 1820 with the Missouri Compromise determining where slavery was going to be and where it wasn't. Uh, or even the idea that, again, whether people realize this or not, the reason why we had the Mexican-American War from 1846 to 1848 was because of slavery. There were people in this country that wanted to expand slavery further west, and they could not do it because Mexico was in the way. There were people in this country that actually went to Cuba to try and push a revolt in Cuba so they could add Cuba to this because there's so much money being made. California comes in in 1850. Their dividing line, I'm sorry, when they become a state, they refuse to divide the state in half because they don't want slavery. They have no need for it. Oregon, they make it illegal for black people to move there because of this idea of freedom at the, at the time, people bringing black people with them. They did not want that there. Uh, in fact, if you were a black person that was found in, in Oregon up to a certain point, you could actually be beaten or killed up to a certain point. I, I can't remember what year it stopped. But um, when people make the argument that slavery does not have a massive connection or a, or I should say a connection like this, they are fooling themselves. Because America's economy itself was driven by slavery. Yes, manufacturing, you know, we had uh, trains, rail lines, all those things that were coming. But if you did not have that free, and I mean free as far as money, the unpaid labor, if you did not have that unpaid labor, you would have never had the types of money being made that would lead to. Here, I'm going to pick on them right now. That would lead to this, and it's backward, to the University of Mississippi being created, the University of Alabama being created. They were both created because they wanted to make sure that slavery was protected as an economic, political, social, and even a religious institution. You want to protect these things. 
I'm so, see you got me you got me hot on that one. Because <laughs> oh yes, we can. All right, there has been before we even talk about repu- reparations, we have to even have a discussion about acknowledging that slavery even existed with some folks. And I say that to piggyback off the question you just asked, which was, you know, this idea that there's this, this connection. And I think the, the issue at hand for a lot of people is not just understanding that slavery happened, but understanding that the reach of slavery can still be felt to this day, as far as the, the things that were taught, the perspectives, um, the fact that white slaveholders and white politicians would use the idea of emancipation to scare the living daylights out of any poor white person. If these Negroes become free, they're going to marry your daughter. No one's going to be able to protect them. And then you see that same line of logic continuing on to, we need to have segregated schools because my daughter shouldn't be in the same classroom as one of these little black boys to where it keeps continuing on and on to where you start having this same thing. Hey, MTV, we can't play black people's music because we shouldn't have black people listening. I'm sorry. We shouldn't have white people listening to black people's music. Now this is coming 50, excuse me, 30 years after you had places that were banning rock and roll because it meant that black and white kids were going to be dancing together. I'm, I'm taking a, a long tangent to get you back, back here because we need to talk about the way in which the, America's original sin, which was chattel slavery, still has fingers in everything. You have financial institutions that would not have existed if it hadn't been for the, the system of slavery. You have businesses that would have long gone under if it hadn't been for, for slave labor. You have institutions, and I'm talking about in the 20th century, because I'm including this type of slavery along with chattel slavery. You have businesses that would just collapse today if prison labor were, if they were prevented from using prison labor, or if they were prevented from using migrant labor, they would be done tomorrow. Um, in fact, Florida is about to see what happens when you have these types of restrictive laws on people uh, because they're going to see the other end of it. And and I guarantee you what's going to happen is there's going to be a push to use prison labor for agriculture um, because they won't be able to get migrant labor. But with respect to reparations, the conversation needed to have started 15 years ago. And, and 15 years ago, it should have started 25 years before that. And it should have started 50 years before that. And it should have started 60 years before that. Because at the tail end of of the war during Reconstruction, slaveholders were given reparations for their lost property, which was individuals, which was human beings. Four and a half million freedmen happened overnight. So when the 13th Amendment hits, you have four and a half million enslaved Negroes become freemen at that point. The average value of an enslaved worker by 1860 was $1,000. In today's money, that's $43,000 per person. Now, let me go ahead and do my little math with my calculator. (laughs) So four or five million times 43,000. All right. At the bare minimum, the bare minimum, you're talking about the value of what those individuals got. They got roughly $200 billion overnight. The enslaved, the enslaved, uh, excuse me, the slaveholders themselves, they got the value of the equivalent of $200 billion overnight just from these men and women going from enslaved to free. These slaveholders, when it comes time to seek damages, they're able to get the equivalent to $200 billion just for the individuals themselves. They still have the land because Andrew Johnson rescinds this this, this order to give land to the enslaved people uh, in South Carolina and parts of Georgia by, by uh, General Sherman. So that land goes back to them as well. 
now they have all the political power and then you have the, the the 15th amendment that now gives black men political power as well but you don't have any enforcement after reconstruction to where now you enter this period of jim crow you're controlling what businesses people can own you're controlling where people can live you're underfunding schools you're bombing churches or burning churches. You're killing anybody who is starting to have this idea of this is how we should run things with black and white coalitions. So you have terrorism that's taking place. Those things cannot be measured in, 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 uh, as a numeric value. You have kidnappings. You have, uh, you have sexual assault that's taking place. So when we talk about reparations, it's going to have to go beyond a financial number. Because one of the most recent studies, and recent, I'm, I'm talking about last five, six years, because there's no official government study. Every time one is pushed, uh, mo most recently, I think Elijah Cummings and John Lewis, uh, before they passed, they were pushing forward at least the study for reparations, not uh, cutting anybody a check, just how much it would cost, like how much of an effect that that free labor, unpaid labor, unpaid slave labor had on the U.S. economy, and you could even factor in the global economy for that matter. The last time that somebody did a study on this that I've looked at, it was saying five to ten trillion dollars. With a T, for anybody who's watching, five to ten trillion dollars as far as the unpaid labor the unpaid, uh, uh, the the access to land that was denied, school, everything. You're talking about that. So when I talk about more than financial, we can start and say $5 trillion is a starting point to think about reparations. But we also need to factor in things like this, the the over-policing, mass incarceration, the, the underfunding of schools, the lack of resources in a lot of cases. You have to factor all that stuff in. So now it needs to become an issue of, uh, it, it becomes an omnibus. So it's not just the money. Now we're talking about actually having programs that are going to be implemented in places that have been hit hard due to these policies. But offline, I have another opinion about reparations, which isn't good for public consumption. <laughs> <laughs> It, I'm yeah. kidding. It's, it's the same thing. It's just it just has a few few other words peppered in, which is <laughs> you need to do something and do something now because my 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 perspective is this: the longer you take to address reparations in any format, the higher the number goes. Mm -hmm. So if you want to save a couple of trillion dollars right now go ahead and push forward with reparations as opposed to 20, 30 years down the road uh, where we're still having this discussion because reparations itself is not a new discussion. It's something that's been taking place since 1866. Excuse mm -hmm. me, let me take that back. It has been taking place since prior to Abraham Lincoln's election in 1860 because reparations wasn't just monetary. It was also, for, for somebody like Lincoln, it was let's just go ahead and push all the black people out and we'll set up a colony, we'll recolonize Africa, and we'll send all the Black people here, there, and they can set up their own country, own government, things become an autonomous uh, nation. Um, oh, I'm going to give you some bad news. <laughs> all right. Do I think they will? No. Do I believe they will? No. Because for a lot of people, it's always going to come down to, and this is this is the interactions I've had at at at, um, at lectures uh, with individuals one on one, leading tours. What some of those people will say is, is, as well as on social media, what some of those people will say: this generation didn't do anything to deserve reparations. Or you will have someone who will be self-reflecting and saying, like, I wasn't a slave. I shouldn't get it. But that's not how compensation works. Mm -hmm. Compensation, when you're looking at damages that were done to someone, can go to the heirs, can go to the family, can go to those individuals. Now, we can talk about how to implement it. But, I mean, that's that's a different discussion. You can We can do... Because one of my ideas with, with any form of reparations 
it starts with kind of like the WPA programs during the New Deal. The government hires, pays for researchers, pays for, for scholars to do all the work. So instead of us going on a genealogy or my 23 or any of these sites and and finding out, you know, having to having to pay for a service to find out who our people are, the government should then go ahead, earmark this money. These people are going to be doing the research and finding every last person we can find as far as their ancestors, because we we are deserving of deep genealogical studies on my father's side. I can go back to the last person who was enslaved. And it's only because of court records that were preserved. My mother's side, I can't go past my great-great-grandmother on, on both of her parents' sides. So I can't go any further than that. And there are people that are starting with less. So the idea that the government can do a deep research to determine who was enslaved, uh, who, who they were enslaved by, is something that needs to be discussed because there are a lot of people that are opposed to it because they know that their name is on that purchase sheet. They know that, and, and I mean, as, as the buyer. So their fear is my great, 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 great grandfather did X and I'm going to be guilty of it, which is not the case. The issue is we need to look at what was going on, how much the government made, how much these businesses made, because this is not unprecedented. You have had uh, the, the, the Sioux or the Dakota? No, it was the Dakota. So the Black Hills, uh, the Dakota of the Black Hills, they won a, a lawsuit against the United States government for stealing their land. They never accepted the money. They won the judgment, but they've never accepted the money because their argument was, we sued because you stole the land from us. And so if you ever look up the Black Hills of, I think, North Dakota or South Dakota, they do not... They have not accepted any of the money that the government has appropriated for them. It's sitting in a bank account gated interest because their thing is reparations for us is give us our land back, give us the mineral resources back, give us this back. The money is not a thing for us. For the the Japanese Americans who were interred at uh, who were put to internment camps in the United States, they won a lawsuit back in the 1980s. And I think it came out to be like twenty thousand dollars per person or twenty thousand dollars per family that was affected. So to make this argument that it's unprecedented or it can't be done, it's false. Even when you start talking about businesses, there were businesses that were sued for their connections to the Nazi government and to the Holocaust back in the, we live in the, in the 80s or the 90s. And there were billions of dollars that were paid out to survivors of the Holocaust by, by Volkswagen, by IBM, uh, by by Krupps, by a bunch of different uh, companies that used their slave labor during the Holocaust, during World War, during that whole period. Uh, so it just becomes an issue of it's something that a lot of people in this country don't want to talk about, don't want to address. That's the biggest obstacle. I mean, the number is not, we haven't even discussed what the number would be because we don't know. And anytime there is a legislation that's trying to be pushed to talk about it to to uh to investigate it it gets shot down quickly uh but you have some places like california uh, i think this one town in indiana is is doing a similar thing one place in illinois mm -hmm. where they're just going ahead and we're going to do reparations ourselves uh because we know of the connections and we're going to do a payout for some people the money may be may be enough right uh, for some, it, it would come in the form of programming and some, it may come in the form of land where it's like, no, I want land of my own that I can do what I want. Uh, I can raise crops. I can I raise a family there. It, it just depends on the person. Um, so I think it really just becomes an issue of, we need to have a starting point and a starting point is a conversation about this within the general public that doesn't involve, uh, any of those buzzwords that 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 politicians like to throw around, as, especially since we're going to be going into a, an election year uh, next year. Yeah, you know, I I can't help think of the irony of the conversations that we can't have at the same time as we are using some of the uh, the same amendments that you were discussing earlier mm -hmm. to discuss how we need to raise the debt ceiling to protect the financial status of the United States, and yet we can't have a conversation about the restoration of the folks who uh, 
who much of that economy was built upon is just very mm -hmm. ironic to me. Well, to and, and not only that, the 14th Amendment was was cited in the Supreme Court case, right? which, which just undid affirmative action at, at, at Harvard and University of North Carolina. So it's mm -hmm. interesting to see how these, these amendments come in and they're applied based on the cases when it just gets icky. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're gonna we're gonna circle back to that. That's gonna be part of my uh, last question for you okay. tonight. But um, one of the things that I wanted to circle back to as well was very early in your presentation, you shared about the uh, the meal market and the establishment of mm -hmm. um, that as a the the place for the sale or hiring out of of slaves. Um, and one of the things that struck me in reading about this topic and preparing for this and then listening to your presentation mm -hmm. was um, twofold. First was how very little we ever hear about slavery in particularly the Northeast uh, compared mm -hmm. to the South. Um, but then also we don't hear often about the connection between uh, Black and Indigenous peoples when it comes to uh, slavery in, in an area like New York. Um, and so I, I guess the question is, why is this not history that we often hear? And what are we missing when we fail to recognize particularly the connectivity between uh, the Black and Indigenous peoples who were uh, bounded or, or bonded out in this way? Okay. All right. I'm going to do what what a lot of historians do, which gets misconstrued. Um, I'm going to I'm going to approach this from the the Marxist presentation, talking about race, mm -hmm. class, identity, uh, and that is one of the reasons why you don't hear about it. Actually, you know, I take it back. I'm going to quote Chris Rock on this one. Chris Rock, in one of his bits, oh, I'm showing my age. This is back in the '90s when he said this. He said in one of his bits that or one of his comedy sketches, said, look, I've seen more polar bears than I've seen Native Americans. Mm -hmm. And the room kind of laughed and he said, no, I want you to think about it. When is the last time you saw two Native Americans? Now, he's somebody who's coming from New York. When is the last time you saw two Native Americans? Now, being in the Southwest, you are going to see indigenous folk. You are going to see a regional peoples. You're going to see them because they're present. We have a very... Eastern centric perspective when it comes to history. So you have the mythology, the fairy tales, the fantasies about, you know, the, the 1492 Columbus sailed the ocean blue, which gets taught to kids. And then my kid comes home and like, don't you, don't you ever sing that? And then we have uh, Plymouth Rock. And then we have all these other things that are talking about the, the romanticizing and, and, and fantasies that get built into historical approaches for, for K-12 education, right? Even for films, like a lot of the stuff gets left out. When it comes to that, for the most part, anytime we're talking about slavery, slavery is talked about with the North and even the Ohio Valley, like this much. And it's more done in the sense of, look, they got rid of slavery a whole lot earlier. But you still had slavery from 1619 until 1802 in some cases, or 1804. You still had slavery, chattel slavery, for a long time. I think the issue is because slavery was not as widespread and not as present in the Northeast that we don't typically think about it taking place. Even, even the states themselves, they, they pushed, well, state legislatures, they push legislation and regulation to end slavery because they want at one point it was voluntary manumission. If you own slaves, you can you can free them. And then it turns into it is now mandatory manumission. We are, we're going to have emancipation programs in the state. If you have slaves, you're going to you're going to be a problem unless you were traveling with your slave. So if you're coming from the south and going to the north, you're traveling with your slave. There'll be a problem, you know, you, you, you probably won't have any problems unless some abolitionists find you. So for the, the story, when we're talking about slavery, for the North, it becomes, at the beginning of the 19th century, it becomes a story of abolition in the North, slavery in the South. 
So we have that dichotomy, even though that's not 100% true. There were a lot of people who did not like the idea of abolitionism. They didn't like abolitionists. Even when it came to labor, there were people who were coming in for factory work and textile mills, things like that, that did not like the fact that slavery existed for the simple fact that it threatened their jobs and threatened their employment. So the idea that we got all these slaves in the South and we have all these wage workers in the North, it, their problem was these guys might bring slavery up here or expand slavery in the North. But it, it's really never something that's talked about because, again, the, the, the amount of enslaved people that you had in slave states dwarfs by comparison the total number of enslaved people when you combine everybody in the North as far as who would have been enslaved. Um, and I, I think that also goes with the, the narrative that we kind of build around it, where it's, it's, it's more understood that there's a war that's fought to end slavery that involves the North fighting against the South or the Union States fighting against the Confederacy. So you never get that moment where we're going to talk about the North as being the bad guy in this situation with respect to slavery. When they're just as heavily involved as, as, as anybody else, it's just you don't see the slaves in the North. You see the end product or, or the product of their, their labor, which would be the cotton or it would be the sugar or it would be some of the finished products that, that are crafted in the South as well. One of the other things that you shared that really uh, stood out and, and I think may be confusing to some in our audience that I'd okay. like to talk about is the, uh, the practice of slaves having that centralized location to hire themselves out um, it, it, that became the meal market. And that designation of that place yeah. is this is the place for both the sale of slaves and for uh, slaves on occasion to actually hire themselves out. Um, and I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about what led to the necessitation of that centralized location and if it's connected to um, the, the what seems to have been a, a very rampant fear of slave rebellion or slave revolt um, or, you know, it, what led to that idea? Oh. Okay. Well, one of the reasons why you're having people being sold or leasing themselves out in that area, one, there's a lot of business. There's a lot of goods that are being traded there, uh, whether you're talking about crops that are being brought in, clothing, furniture, you know, wares, things like that. So a lot of business is being conducted there. So it becomes a centralized location for if you want to get a good deal, this is where you go. Or if you want to have a place where this it, it eventually becomes legislated to where if you're going to have slaves being sold or leasing, it has to be done here because it has to be observed. It has to be regulated. Um, and it also has to be monitored because you also do want to ensure that you don't have a bunch of enslaved people running in their perspective. You don't want to have a bunch of enslaved people running around on the outskirts of New York or anywhere else. You want to have them observed. You want to have them watched. You want to make sure that um, you want to make sure that there's no threat. It is really what it comes down to in a lot of these a lot of these slave markets. We're going to have a specific place that's set up for you to go to, where when you're done, I don't know if you're working for a tailor. There's only so much work you're going to be able to do, and, and when you get permission to lease yourself out, you go and say, "Hey, my name is Jim." Uh, I'm I'm free on Saturdays if you need someone to, I don't know, uh, drive your carriage for you. So they would actually negotiate the terms for their employment. And for some folks, because the, the slavery laws were much more lenient than they were in the South, they could make enough money to actually free themselves or buy their freedom and buy the freedom of somebody else and then become part of the abolitionist movement. Whereas in the South, unless you're talking about a city like New Orleans or Charleston, um, yeah, gosh, what was the other one? It wasn't Richmond. But anyway, um, Norfolk, I think, was it. So Norfolk, Charleston, and New Orleans. Unless you're talking about those places, you didn't have it happen because you had slave markets uh, like Congo Square and, and, and a couple other ones in New Orleans where you could go if you were a um, enslaved individual who had some freedom as far as, as far as some freedom of movement that you could go and lease yourself out in your downtime. So if you were a dock worker 
and there's no ship that day, I need something to do. I, I need to raise some money because vagrancy was was frowned upon even then. It was seen as like you were doing, you were up to something if you didn't have a job. Uh, and that actually circles me back to a, a, an audience question that was asked earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to find it here. Um, they were asking if we could talk about the reasoning behind black boys and men uh, being held up as, as scary uh, and that representation oh. of, of black men and boys. Um, and it seems like there is a parallel between uh, the, the modern representation of the threatening black male and at this time, a system where you had people who were bonded in slavery, uh, who were who were in some cases made to hire themselves out or, or mm -hmm. given the freedom to hire themselves out, and freedom is certainly in quotes there. And, and um, then you also had the the slaveholders that would then lease them out to make more money off of their right. bodies. In yeah. case I didn't bring that up. And the parallel of, of that, um, of, of leasing them out to do that while also being terrified of what they would do with that, uh, that temporary allowance. So um, let's, let's just talk about it. Where oh. does that imagery come from and why does it persist today? All right. There are a lot of things, because even when you talk about the, the scary black man trope, um, there becomes this way of weaponizing blackness. And I think on one of the slides I put on criminalizing blackness, but there's also this weaponizing of blackness as well, where whether you're talking about within the U S or you're talking about in the Caribbean, it was the same perspective of black idle black men are dangerous because if they're idle, they will think about their situation and start plotting. And even mm -hmm. before something like the the Nat Turner Rebellion, um, you you had these concerns about what black men are going to do if they're left to their own devices, if they're left alone, if they don't have anything to do. So states would have, and I'm going to come back to the beginning of this, but states would have particular legislation that prevented black men, black male mobility. So women could move from plantation to plantation a lot easier than men could because women are, were not being suspected of you're up to something, you're plotting, you're doing these things because, you know, there's eugenics, there's there's junk science that's used saying that women don't have this natural affinity to, to fight and they're not dangerous, they're not plotting any nefarious type of thing. They, they can't commit violence. So in the few cases that Black women do commit violence, it's shocking. To, to these individuals, that these women would rebel in such a way. But when it came to Black men, any moment that they were seen as somebody was not in control of them, it was as if you had a wild animal. Mm. It's kind of like, and I hate making this comparison, but I have to because we're talking about people who were deemed un subhuman. You have a neighbor that has a dog. Is the dog scary when it's by itself or when it's with its owner? Mm. And I'm talking about big dog, little dog, doesn't matter. You don't see that dog with its owner. You immediately think something bad is going to happen. I might get bitten. So that was the perspective that these slaveholders and even people associated with the slave trade and slavery itself had, which is if there's not a white person watching you, you can't be trusted because you might be plotting. And you saw things, you saw policies like this take place uh, in the military up through um, up through Vietnam. I, I, I've sat with some Vietnam veterans and they talked about how we were having a conversation, there were three of us. And one of them joked, he said, man, 30 years ago, I couldn't do this. And I was like, what are you talking about? We couldn't stand together. There are three, uh, three of us and then like one guy walked up and he was explaining that the military had a policy at that time that if there were black people, there were more than three black people together, they might be plotting something. And this goes back to, to slavery itself. So mm -hmm. what, this, what this gentleman was telling me was like, we would grab one of the cool white guys to come hang out with us. And it was to protect us from somebody else who thought we were up to something. So this trope, it starts 
not not uh, particularly tied to slave revolts, but just the idea that these men who have a physical size, who are doing uh, 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 jobs that are physically demanding and working with tools that are very dangerous. If they decided we're out in the sugarcane fields and I've got machetes, if we decided that we're all just going to pick up our machetes and start going and killing every white person, there's nothing to stop you unless there's another white person to watch you and make sure that you're not doing that. Um, and you see the same thing with policing where there could be some young black men, you know, just one black person. I shouldn't even say a, a, a group. You could have one black person that's minding their own business. And because of the way that people are taught to police, they will then zero in on that one black kid, that one black uh, girl and, and, and harass them because they think that they might be doing something that they're not supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. But you also have this disarming factor, which is this belief in black intellect or this, this uh, misbelief in black intellect which leads to things like the Jim Crow tropes, the Mammy, the Jezebel, Sambo, things like that, where it's like, well, these ones aren't scary. That one is. But if I know that you're not like them, I can be around you and I can trust you. But it's a very short trip from you going from a black person I can trust to a black person I'm afraid of if I don't know of what the scenario, what the situation is. Um, and, I, and I liken it to... I love giving pop cultural examples. I liken it to the Miss Millie from uh, The Color Purple, where's this great, you already know the scene where I'm going. Yeah. There's this scene where she's driving, the car gets stuck in the gear or something, and she ends up, you know, going back and forth in the car. And all the men are like, ma'am, you know, well, Miss Millie will help you, will help you, will help you. And she just starts freaking out and then goes to Sophia and says, this man, he was going to attack me. He was going to attack me. He was going to do this. And then talking about the way in which these fears become are, are so irrational, but they're rational to the irrational. I don't trust black people around me. Why? Because they're dangerous. How? Well, because they could do X, Y, and Z. Couldn't you say the same thing about someone from this group? Well, no, that's different because those people do X and this group does Y. So you have this moment where someone has become so indoctrinated in this idea of little black boys can't be seen as little black boys like Tamir Rice. They're seen as grown men. And grown men, grown black men are never up to any good. They're always doing something that they shouldn't be doing. Whether we're talking about the reefer madness uh, panic back in the, the 1930s and 40s, whether we're talking about the, the rock and roll craze, whether we're talking about the free love movement, whether we're talking about the 1980s where, you know, blackness start, starts to become more on display or the 90s where you're actually, you've got, you virtually have no, inter, I'm sorry, you have no segregated schools at this point, virtually, you know, there are still a few. But you've got people that are going to school with these other black kids and their parents are telling them, like, you shouldn't hang out with this black boy because of uh, it, it, it could be a dangerous situation. And you also have black people there that are saying that you shouldn't hang out with other black people as well. So it becomes mm -hmm. so ingrained, not just within the white mind, but also within the black mind of like, yeah, there are some black people out there that I don't want to mess with. But you become so indoctrinated in it, you treat all black people that way or the majority of the black people that you are unfamiliar with as a, I don't know, as a coping mechanism, as a, as a survival mechanism, but I just like to look at it as, as irrational. It's just the way that people were programmed to think about another group of people. But I, I always have the same question too. I'm like, if they were so dangerous, then why, why do you have so many of them around you? <laughs> you have all these ones that you bought, but they're so dangerous. Right. Uh, one question that came up earlier, and I didn't want to miss it, um, it's, it's one that we often come back to, especially as we're talking about the connection between uh, 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 Black peoples who were enslaved and Indigenous mm -hmm. peoples who were enslaved at that same yes. time in, in New York. Um, the question was, do you think that the descendants of those enslaved are uh, Indigenous to the United States? What do you mean? Uh, I think it's the... Uh, the theory that you know the 
those who were uh, brought from Africa and enslaved in this country um, are were taken from their indigenous homeland and brought okay. here and became kind of a new uh, people. Oh, and so okay, the question okay. Of whether or not then they and their descendants, us, um, have that title of being indigenous to this country. I I would say we have a different status. Uh, one, because I wouldn't want to take indig indigeneity away from people who legitimately are 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 that. Um, I I would give a different status, which is limbo, uh, and that's mm -hmm. why I say like as part of a reparations discussion, there needs to be genealogical studies, genealogical just work being done to to track down who you are, who you descended from. I mean, even to go so far as to figure out what part, what tribe your family had come from, as opposed to, you know, this, you're just from Western Africa. No, let me know exactly where, because I need to have that connection. Um, mm -hmm. We have, we have what's known as, as a disconnected identity. So we know that we have African roots, but we don't all know where those roots are in the ground. Mm -hmm. And so it comes down to, we, you know, trying to figure out where it is. Uh, but like I said, me personally, I would not want to to use that term. Um, I, I feel like we we've, we've been here for well, even before 1619, uh, because you got to include the entire continent. But you have black people who've been on this continent, who've been descended from people from on this continent for hundreds of years. Um, but I think if we were to make that argument, we would be able to make the same argument for uh any european people who had been here for the same amount of time or who descended from the same amount so I'd, i wouldn't want to take indigeneity away from people who are indigenous to the area or at least have been been here a lot longer than any of us have been there was a really uh, great point that you made early in your presentation about skilled labor and they're not really being any such thing as unskilled labor, mm -hmm. right? Because if you, if you need that skill, then it becomes skilled labor. Um, and I, I really couldn't help but think of, and you went into it as you went further in, the forced skilled labor of, of the uh, enslaved or our enslaved ancestors in parallel to the forced skilled labor of those who are part of the prison industry, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. Um, and you mentioned there being discussions now that have been working against that and working against the loophole for uh, slavery through the prison system. So what would be your takeaway for our audience in, in terms of what they need to understand about the connection between the legacy of slavery and the modern system of mass incarceration? They are, aside from chattel slavery, they are essentially the same and chattel slavery is is basic gosh i don't even want to like want to use the term birthright but chattel slavery is a system that is set up which makes slavery an inheritable characteristic so if your mother was an enslaved person and this is started from 1662 if your mother was an enslaved person you coming out of the womb are an enslaved person so aside from that, I would say they're virtually the same because you have those same abuses that are made. You have those same tropes, stereotypes that are being used. Uh, you have that same dehumanization that's taking place with respect to uh, the incarcerated, which, again, I, I've spoken to a, a few people who've... I, I've spoke to one gentleman, uh, uh, not Clyde Belcourt. Well, no, Clyde Belcourt, who was in prison also. Um Albert Woodfox, he passed away this past year. He was mm -hmm. exonerated um, a few years ago. And he was in, in Angola prison for, I think, 26 years, uh, falsely accused, falsely convicted. And these individuals all say the same thing. Like, you, you don't get to be a human being in there. Mm -hmm. So the idea of treating enslaved people as subhuman has transferred itself over into the carceral state, which is you can't be treated like a human. And as a result, if you're treating people as something as subhuman, what are you going to get in response? 
you're not going to get somebody who's going to sit there and like, no, please treat me like a human. Please treat me like a human. We're going to be defiant about things. And, and you know, we might might be aggressive. Uh, we, we, we're definitely not going to be docile. We're going to respond to the treatment that is given. So it then becomes this cycle of something happens in the prison or something bad goes down and uh, the, the public opinion or even the media will present it as, you know, these people aren't deserving of rights. These people aren't deserving of fair treatment which there is no loophole for the 14th and fifth. Well, I'm sorry for the 14th amendment, as far as being treated equally. Um, even in prison, you, you still have certain rights that you're allowed to have. I mean, within limits, uh, but you should still be treated as a human being. So when it comes to this comparison between the two, the two periods, whether we're talking about um, the period of chattel slavery, or we're talking about the period of the carceral state, you still have the same advantages being taken as far as people being in being, excuse me, being able to invest in these companies that are housing these individuals, um, companies being able to use their labor at no cost or as little cost as possible and raking in massive profits over it. And then when they get out, I, actually, I take that back. There's one difference. When slavery ended, chattel slavery ended, you at least had a skill that was transferable. So if I'm going from enslavement to being a freeman, if I have land, I can then work on that land, build a home, raise crops, support a family. There's no barrier to that. However, if I'm in a prison and I'm learning a skill, learning a new skill while I'm in that prison, I will more than likely, more likely than not, be barred from using that skill when I get out. Because the same company that hired me while I was in prison more than likely will not hire me when I get out. But there are there are some good companies um, that that will hire um, those who serve their time. I think Domino's was one. There's uh, Dave's Bread, Ben and Jerry's. I think um, they all. And I don't. I can't say whether or not any of them use you know any tax credits as far as like. Uh, 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 for hiring people who, who've been uh, released from prison. But I know that they at least make it a one of their programs to hire people, I'm sorry, make it available for people to work for them without having to worry about, hey, you you signed this box that where you, you were a convict and you can't work here now. Or you did five to 10 years in prison and we don't we are not comfortable with you working here. You have places that want to give people second, third, and fourth chances so they can at least put a roof over their heads, put food in their in their mouths or on their plates. Mm -hmm. So I would say like the biggest difference is you didn't have the same transition from slavery to freedom as 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 you end up with with uh from incarceration to freedom. Yeah, that that seems to be so core to the story of Black people in this country is that that state of constant transition. Mm -hmm. You know, we're neither um, we were created here, but we're not of here. Um, right. We we weren't able to transition um, out of the the skills that we both brought from our native land and, and were so core to this country um, were essentially used against and then uh, forced as labor. And then, uh, but that transition was not allowed to happen mm -hmm. from taking that same skilled labor into gainful employment or, or uh, advancement through the economic system that relied on it. So there's, there's just so many things there to, wrap our minds around and and uh try and reckon with as a nation and as a people right um and i i warned you <laughs> at the beginning that i was going to circle back to this uh in talking about some of the um really there were several monumental decisions that came down from the supreme court last week mm -hmm. um, but probably top and chief among them was the affirmative action decision that rolled back progress um, for so many marginalized people. 
Um, and it's hard not to think of that and think of those actions in terms of the loopholes and legacies of slavery that were built into the Declaration, the Constitution, the, the framework for America's mm -hmm. systems. Um, and so as we reflect in these days after the 4th of July uh, and think about the revolution that it took to get us to the Declaration of Independence and future celebrations uh, or modern celebrations of American freedom, um, I, I want to rope us back or, or take us back to a place of a little bit of hope <laughs> in this conversation and uh, and and offer you the opportunity to share what you would say uh, that we need to be doing now to bring awareness to and continue to fight against those loopholes uh, and maybe what's the action that we should be taking uh, as our audience tonight um, to continue moving forward and to maybe come to that place where we are able to, to reconcile those things. Two things, uh, two groups I would say deserve everybody's attention. Uh, one is the Innocence Project. Uh, they do outstanding work. I mean, because one, we got to talk about, you know, making sure that people who should have had a fair trial get one. But if they didn't, or if they, you know, trumped up on charge, they should, they should receive justice. Uh, so Innocence Project and then the Equal Justice Initiative is another one. Uh, they do outstanding work. There's a great museum in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, about the work that they've done with respect to mass incarceration and talking about how, the problematic issues that are there. Um, one individual not connected to 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 either of those groups, but uh, Yusuf Salam, who was is one of the exonerated five, formerly the the Central Park Five, uh, just won his his um, won a seat for the city council. Uh, and and I'm bringing it up because what I would suggest to someone, and I need to take this advice as well once I get settled some, someplace, is be active. Um, ask these questions. Like if you have an opportunity to go to a town hall or a debate or anything like with, with any uh, people who are running, like bring these issues up because in all honesty, you know, there's states, things are going the way they're going in Florida, but there are states like Florida, state legislatures and, and political officials that are trying to do the right thing uh, by thinking, uh, by having things like uh, restorative voting rights, uh, rest restoring voting rights, as well as restorative justice um, to ensure that people who have served their time actually have a chance when they get out. Mm -hmm. Uh, but even before we're talking about people getting out, you have to have this 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 acknowledgement that this is not the way in which a system should operate. Um, whereas prison, prison itself, you know, with with the um, now, of course, I forgot the the term uh, penitentiary. So it, it it comes from the word penitent, as far as like you're going here to to pay for your crime or pay whatever. Uh, time you have that's equivalent to the time that they've assigned you, uh, I'm sorry, whatever they've deemed as equivalent to an appropriate time for you to serve based on the crime that you committed or have been convicted of. Um, but I would, I would definitely recommend um, reading, because I always have my books ready. I always do, but I don't have them ready now. Um, Inhuman Bondage, Soul by Soul, uh, the half has never been told, but it chained in silence. Uh, I'll, I'll email you the, the the book list I have. But there are a lot of books that talk about the way the new Jim Crow is always the one I'm going to recommend. Um, but the way in which you started to see, at least you can make the connection between the expansion of the carceral state almost in response to gains made in the civil rights movement because you do not have a high prison population in the 60s and the 70s. The prison population shoots up in the 1980s uh, with things like those mandatory minimums, the war on drugs, things like that, or the expansion of the war on drugs. You do not have those numbers that are reflective of numbers that look to be more people 
in prison now than enslaved. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's so many connections to it. Like I, I could go on for hours. I don't want to, <laughs> but uh, the, the thing I would say is, is definitely, definitely start talking to some folks uh, uh, about what you can do with equal justice initiative, uh, innocence project. There are a lot of local ones. I know there are a few uh, organizations in, in Arizona that, that do the same thing as far as like helping people get resettled, but then also exposing those companies that have been doing that, uh, uh, you know, using, well, essentially they've been using slave labor. Uh, I, I shouldn't say it any other way. They've been using slave labor and getting away with it because, uh, because they can. I love it. <clears throat> thank you, as no, thank always, you. for this conversation um, and for closing us out in that way. I think that's such an important thing and, and really the heart of what we are trying to do uh, with the Live Black experience is provide those opportunities for people to have those conversations and start to find ways that they can not just uh, hear and learn and, and experience what others have experienced by sharing these stories, but then giving them that next step of now here's what you do with this. Um, it's not just hearing it and holding on to it, it's now taking it and doing a meaningful action. So very appreciative of you for, for sharing all of this with us. Well, and I would also, I would also add this, have conversations with relatives, friends, co-workers, folks at your churches, your, your community organizations about this, because not that many people know, or they already have that perspective of, well, they went to jail. No, that's, that's not a good enough reason for somebody to be uh, in this situation. Um, definitely, definitely talk to folks and see what, what you can get going because we, we've, we've tried locally. I should say we, I mean, then the larger we, um, talking about things like Parchman Prison here in Mississippi, which Parchman Prison is one of notoriously one of the worst prisons in the country. Um, and, and there are no attempts. And, and I think the state population, as far as the proportion of Mississippi, I think it's 45% black last time I looked. Um, but it, it, this is the largest proportional amount of black people in, in, in the country, mm -hmm. but the population for Parchman prison is somewhere around high eighties, uh, for, for black prisoners. Um, so you start to see how a lot of these politics, I'm sorry, a lot of these policies and policing becomes heavily racialized and you have people who don't have the resources to even get a fair trial. But that's what I would say. Po politics or politics? <laughs> Both. <laughs> Both, one and the same. Amen to that. <laughs> uh, Miss Bernadine, do you want to close us out? I would. I, um, Brother Doctor, when you come on, it's, we, we love to have you. We, we love you. We love you so much because you bring us the truth and, and, and sometimes it makes us angry and, and feel some sort of way. But um, at the end, this is why we do this. Um, this is what we all need. So mm. this, this truth that you bring us is, is not only for us as a people to keep us grounded, to keep us humbled, uh, to keep us in remembrance of, of from whence we have come. And, and because of you bringing us these hard talks, um, it, it acts for us as a people of African descent um, as a, a, a way to develop a roadmap on, on how we uh, need to travel um, in moving forward. I, I, I want to close us on, I, you know, I, I think for those who see this, 
um, after this live stream, you know, it'll be out there on YouTube for, for others to see. If anyone questions why we do this, um, I mean, your your last words sums it up because you 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 gave us um, what it is that we all need to do, no matter what uh, ethnicity or creed, the color of our skin. That is something um, we all need to get involved if we say this is America and we all are here, um, and we talk about inclusion. Uh, then I think what you are proposing um, as far as getting engaged in, in, in this um, incarceration process, um, that is something that we all need to do. Um, oh, one, one last, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, go ahead. When jury duty, when you get the jury duty summons, go. <laughs> yes. Because that is something else that uh, somebody was pointing out to me that the the juries that get selected the the people get selected to do jury duty um, imagine that that person is not does not want to ha ensure that you receive justice they just want to mm -hmm. see you behind bars now do you want to show up and go to jury duty and and actually advocate listen to what's going on person might be guilty might not I mean you don't go in there. Like I'm going to free everybody, but you, you want to make sure that that person is going to get a fair trial. And I think one mm -hmm. of the things that, that a lot of us, uh, do I'm just uh, getting it all encompassing. We look at jury duty as a burden when we should look at it as a responsibility and something that is going to ensure that this is one of the reasons why those numbers are so high. You have folks that do not have the resources and you have people who just decide like, I don't need to go to jury duty. I'll, right. I'll tell them something crazy so I can get out of it. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to close us out this evening on, um, I mean, on something from the weeping day. And mm -hmm. um, I, um, I, I think I'm kind of proud about being, um, the Girl Scouts first black tour guide in Savannah, Georgia for historic Savannah. And um, I remember when um, I guess I wasn't satisfied with the history um, booklet that that the Girl Scouts gave me, I wanted to know mo more. And so I went to the library and it was a woman um, of African descent, actually the descendant of um, Sea Island enslaved souls from South Carolina. And uh, she pointed me to history about Savannah that um, many did not know. And so the Weeping Day was one of them. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'd like to close us out on, I want to pick up from where you left off and, um, and thank you for that. Um, during that day, there was um, an engaged couple. Um, and um, Jeffrey was 23 years old and he was a cotton hand and he was engaged to the love of his life. Her name was Dorcas. And the records show that she was Chateau number 278 uh, from the Butler Plantation in coastal Sea Island, Georgia, which is right next to where my people are from, Saplo Island, Georgia. Okay. But as they were standing on the auction block, Dorcas turned to his uh, new slave master and he said this. He said, I loves Dorcas, young master. 
I loves her well and true. She says she loves me and I know she does. The good Lord knows I love her better than I loves anyone in this whole wide world. Never can love another woman half as well. Mm. Please love Dorcas, please buy Dorcas Massa. We be good servants to you as long as we live. We'll be married right away soon, young Massa, and the children will be healthy and strong. Massa, and, and they'll do and they'll be good servants too. Please buy Dorcas, young Massa. We loves each other a heap. Do really true, Massa. Mm. And in spite, this new slave master did not buy mm -hmm. Dorcas. And so I end this live stream this evening, maybe not on a good note, not on a high end. On a, pensive, on a pensive note, pensive but note. on a pensive note that to remind us that we are the people who are still carrying this trauma. Mm -hmm. And as a reminder to those who are not like us, uh, that when you are engaging and dealing with us and working with mm -hmm. us and living with us, that we carry these traumas and, and we're still seeking to find ways to be healed mm -hmm. and to overcome. Right. And so with that being said, the brother, doctor, I love you. We love you. We always enjoy you being with us. And we know that you will be back with us. I Robert. love all of you. And you know, I will be back. <laughs> and we'd love to have you back. And, and Sister Kara, bless you for, for always being so thoughtful in the questions um, that you bring. Um, that make us all think and, and have to consider. And so to the LBE viewers and supporters, we thank you. Um, continue to follow us, continue to learn with us, continue to live this experience with us. And so until we meet again, go in peace. <laughs>